But let's try to settle the debate once and for all. Is it time to give up meat and turn vegan? Uh, much has been made of the benefits of a vegan diet, but how much of that is fact? Well, to answer that, I'm joined by vegan activist Ed Winter, also known as Earthling Ed. He's a prolific public speaker who has been invited to schools, universities and businesses across the world to discuss the issue. And while in the meat corner, I have Chris Snowden, head of lifestyle economics at the IEA. Ed, I'm going to start with you. Sure. Thank you for joining me today. Can you explain to me, um, you, you are a vegan activist. Sure. So it's not just a, a lifestyle choice for you. It's, it's something you're very passionate about. Yeah. Do you feel that you envisage a world where everyone eventually uh, embraces the vegan approach? Well, hopefully so. I mean, obviously, I am aware that not everyone in the world is going to be able to make the options and you know, choose the choices that we have in, yeah. in the UK especially. But my hope is that in the UK, we'll shift towards a plant-based food system for all the merits that a plant-based food system would bring. Just talk us through it then. So sure. people watching this at home, they might not have heard of what the merits are. Yeah. Why is a vegan diet better for you than a meat-based diet? Well, I mean, veganism is, is a moral philosophy. So it's about removing or at least eliminating as far as is possible and practicable the exploitation of animals. Yeah. So there's a moral you know, obligation to it as well. But of course, it helps the environment, helps the planet. And there's also personal health um, kind of positives that can come from it as well. But it is about the animals fundamentally. So, yes, yeah, so you're not, it's not, you're not talking about from a, a personal point of view, from a selfish point sure. of view. This is more a kind of uh, a global perspective. Yeah, I mean, it's about trying to reduce suffering wherever we possibly can. And you take it further than just vegetarianism. So, you know, I mean, I've read, I haven't seen, but I've read accounts of what goes on in abattoirs, and it yeah. does strike me as, to be honest, horrific. And, um, but the, you would extend that to the use of animal products, for instance, uh, when an animal's died of natural causes or something like that, that would also be... Well, not necessarily natural causes. Of course, we will want to eat animals who have died of natural causes because of the diseases, but this is more about the human exploitation of animals. So not necessarily you know, an animal who's dead on the side of the road, but the farming of animals and, of course, the abattoirs that we use, even with, with dairy cows, neg and hens, of course, because all of those animals are also killed in the same slaughterhouses in the same way. So it's about that human aspect of the exploitation. OK, well, let me bring Chris in on this because I'd be interested to hear the counter-argument to that. Chris, thanks for joining me today. Uh, are you a big carnivore? Are you a big fan of meat? Yep. Big fan <laughs> of meat. Uh, and, what, what is there to object to in what Ed is saying? I mean, it seems quite, seems fair enough to me when he puts it like that. Well, people make their own moral judgments, don't they? I'm, I'm not interested in what other people uh, eat. If people want to be vegans or vegetarians or carnivores, it's of no concern to me whatsoever. I hear the arguments. I make my own mind up. Everyone should be free to make their own mind up. So go for it, whatever you, whatever you want to do. My only concern about the, the veganism and, and vegetarian movement is at some point in the future, it is possible that these people will become a majority. And once you get a majority, people who think that something is ethically um, unacceptable, then there's a good chance they're going to go out and try and ban it. So I'm, I'm all in favour of people being vegans, but I'd rather they remained a minority. What about what Ed says about the, uh, the animal rights aspect to this? I mean, to what extent? I mean, you say everyone should have their own right to make their own decisions about what they eat, and that's fair enough. But if we are, according to animals, their rights as well, don't they have to be taken into consideration to a degree? No, I don't. I mean, I think animals are essentially there to be killed neat. So, I mean, that argument is never going to cut the, you know, the, the mustard with me particularly obviously there you know there, there are lines I, I wouldn't cross i've never eaten veal for example i've never eaten foie gras i think there's such a thing as unnecessary cruelty uh clearly and i'm you know I happily sling people who torture cats and dogs and things in, in prison for quite a long period of time not least because it's uh, usually a pretty good precursor to being a serial killer but i think um in the natural world obviously billions of animals are killed and eaten every day by other animals i don't see any particular reason why they shouldn't be killed and eaten by humans. So this is going to be something, Ed, that um, you will face routinely, is that, that of course, uh, you know, Chris is arguing from a position of natural law sure. there. We know we are on the food chain, yeah. are we not? There is something natural about eating meat. We have, we have developed that way. Well, of course, we've eaten meat for thousands of years, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, and it's been instrumental in human survival in times of food scarcity. But, you know, the reference to other animals who eat other animals in the wild, well, they do that out of necessity. And the vegan argument is really that we don't have to do what we do to animals anymore, and that's why it becomes a moral issue. Uh, Chris said it was about unnecessary cruelty. That's why he didn't eat you know, veal or, mm. or foie gras. But, of course, we don't have to eat animal products, so it's all unnecessary. You know, and to a dairy cow who's killed for dairy or to a pig in a gas chamber who's killed for bacon, that suffering to them is just as severe as the suffering to a geese or a duck who's been exploited for foie gras. So when we look at this issue from that of the, the individual who's suffering, we realise that it's all unnecessary, and that's why it's all immoral. But doesn't your argument rest on the presupposition that, that uh, 
animal life and human life should be seen almost on a par and that rights are accorded uh, to everyone, mm. whereas, whereas Christopher's argument is more that well, human beings are more important than animals. Well, we don't have to view non-human animals as being the same as, as human animals to, to understand why it's wrong to kill them. We just have to understand that their right to life and their right to their own autonomy transcends the reasons we use to exploit them. So taste pleasure, for example, or convenience. You know, that's what we have to really kind of underpin with this conversation is, is their right to life and mm. the suffering they endure in farms and slaughterhouses worth more than our sensory pleasure? You know, what has higher value, life or taste fundamentally? OK, so Christopher, when you hear that argument, um, do you think that there is a case here that, I mean, Ed is trying to persuade people of his, his point of view. Do you think that's ever a view that people will buy into ultimately? Or is there just something too innate about our taste for meat? Into it. There's more vegans than there ever been before. I think there's probably more vegetarians than there's ever been before. A lot of people get on and get off that particular um, bandwagon, but you can see how you know you can see the the argument. I don't. It's not like I disagree with the argument. Really, it's just it, it's that's the point of view which, and I just don't hold it. And you'll never get me to accept that an animal's life is worth the same as a human's life. And I don't think it's something you could ever prove empirically either way. You know, what do you make of? Uh, I mean, there's obviously been a rise of uh, very militant uh, uh, veganism with people for calling for veganism to be a protected characteristic within the law. Do you think that this is something that you would uh, you understand? In any way? Well, not really. I mean, I understand there are vegan militants, and I think it's potentially quite a dangerous thing because once you have a lot of people who think that animals' life, that chicken's life, is worth the same as a human being's, then I suppose they feel morally entitled to go around um, attacking people who who rear chickens or whatever. And you get the similar kind of thing you do, of course, with the anti-abortion crowd, where you have. Uh, abortion centres being uh, yeah, set on fire. And that's why we need to respect each other's views without resorting to uh, extremism, militantism and uh, and violence. But I, if I may say so, the, the argument that you know, meat is unnecessary and then therefore we shouldn't consume it, I don't buy into. Uh, you hear this a lot from puritanical campaigners that something's unnecessary. Alcohol is unnecessary. Tobacco is unnecessary. Music, I mean, all sorts, most things are unnecessary. Human beings, one of the things that sets human beings apart from animals actually is that we have a lot of things in life that are luxuries and are unnecessary. They, we don't need them per se to exist, um, but they hugely enrich our lives. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's a good thing. Ed, I want to ask you about that specifically. Is that, yeah. you know, Christopher is making this point that, well, you know, there are all sorts of things that we have uh, that are luxuries. Sure. I mean, so it's, that is a persuasive argument, isn't it? Well, not really, because the things that Chris listed don't have a victim. You know, our choice of, you know, the music we want to listen to or things like that, there's no victim at the end of it. But when we talk about meat, dairy and eggs, there's a victim at the end of that choice. You know, the animals who are, of course, being exploited and killed, they're the victim. So when we talk about unnecessary action, from a moral perspective, it's about whether or not that action has a victim and does, that action is unnecessary. Does alcohol and smoking have a victim ultimately? But it's your own the... personal choice in that sense. But there are people who are affected by your, by your alcoholism, and of, by your passive smoking, sure. you know, this kind of and thing. And of course we should definitely be considerate of that. I'm not saying that we should <sighs> ban sm smoking or cigarettes. I'm not even saying that we should ban meat, dairy and eggs right now. What I'm saying is that we should have conversations about the morality of these actions to determine whether or not we as individuals, morally speaking, align with that. I mean, I mean Chris himself said that he would be outraged if someone did this to a cat, you know, maybe the Kurt Zuma yeah. case comes to mind. But the, the real question is, well, why is that wrong, but putting pigs into a gas chamber morally right? So, why, you know, where is that hypocrisy? Where does that come from? You make a very persuasive case because we're sitting here having this discussion. But I mentioned the sort of more militant approach. Um, do you worry that when you have more militant voices within this debate, they're actually putting people off your argument? Well, well, yes and no. I mean, I don't think that this idea of militant veganism is really representative. I think it's kind of a media talking point that's been blown out of proportion, to be you know, perfectly honest. But I see it's also been something I can play to my advantage, because hopefully by having reasonable, constructive conversations, it shows to people that veganism isn't this extremist ideology. In fact, it's just this kind of extension of the values we already have. Yeah. How often do we hear that Brit Britain is a nation of animal lovers and that we stand against animal suffering and cruelty? Well, I, I like to believe that's how people genuinely feel. So now all people have to do is recognise that their morality already exists when it comes to animals, you know, that strong morality, and then work out whether or not the unnecessary exploitation, suffering and death of a billion land animals, and when it comes to marine animals much more, of course, in this country alone, aligns with that morality, or indeed is actually contradictory to that. Uh, final word to you, Christopher. I'm assuming you're not persuaded by what you just heard there. No, I'm not. I remain of the view that animals, for the most part, are there to be uh, killed and eaten. Most of them have a perfectly good life. If you are a, a sheep raised by a farmer, you'll, you'll just be basically standing around 
in a field eating grass for a period of time, and then one day you'll get a bolt in the back of your head. It's a pretty painless way to go. Everybody dies. Ultimately, I don't consider that to be unnecessary cruelty. In actual fact, I think that a lot of animals get a better death than uh, human beings do, but that's a different uh, question. Maybe well, human beings don't have their drugs, obviously. Well, look, I didn't expect for us to reconcile and reach a sort of uh, agreement at the end of the debate, but I do appreciate you both coming on and sharing your views.